Uh, greetings, friends and comrades. Daniel with you again for a conversation on Adorno and ideology. Welcoming to the show from Kansas City, Jacob Bard Rosenberg, who is a archivist, a communist philosopher and thinker, translator, uh, a just recently, somewhat recently finished dissertation on Theodore Adorno. Uh, I guess also also uh, Alto Benjamin as well on on memory and forgetting and dreams in both thinkers. Um, and yeah, so coming at us from Kansas City, uh, welcome to the show. Thanks for your time today. Hi, Super Daniel. Excited. Thank you for having me. I, I really appreciate it. So Jacob has been an important figure on the left for quite a while, in my view, and we're so sort of honored that you're spending this time with us to, to look at something which we don't think about a lot when it comes to Adorno studies, which is the topic of ideology. Adorno um, had quite a lot to say on this. He, he gave several lectures on ideology um, and has published this fascinating essay, uh, which you have recently translated. So our, our goal is to sort of, I don't know, unearth this for you. So we're going to be maybe a little um, didactic or professorial. Um, and, and this conversation can can steer wherever wherever it shall go. Yeah, we'll see. We'll see where it takes us. I mean, it, it's uh, it's some material that comes from many directions and which can go in many directions. Indeed. So, perhaps we could begin by by saying something about um, um, the sort of historical basis of ideology coming out of um, the Stutte Tracy, uh, the Enlightenment. The, the 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 I mean it's a pre-French Revolution concept technically, but of course the 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 French Revolution under the Napoleonic Restoration sort of concretizes ideology and and um, in in a, in a highly political way, um, which of course would eventually lead to um, that particular conception of ideology's demise uh, in some sense, it, it, precisely because the contradictions of bourgeois society could not. Um, uh, get at the get at the heart of 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 how ideology was construed, and then of course Marx comes and and frankly reveals uh, these limitations. So, can you help us with that prehistory, if that's the right word, the sort of the yeah? I mean, so yeah. Like, maybe maybe it's good actually to start. I mean, I'm, I'm going to speak briefly about the prehistory, but also just to to say that this prehistory of ideology is not a story that is told very often and that if you uh, like w w one of the things i guess we will get onto is like wh why it might be important to look at its history um but if you you know if you look at the literatures of the 20th century uh in some ways this is like a concept without a history um it's a it's a concept which is applied all over the place and so if i i mean i i remember looking at terry eagleton's book on ideology right and uh eagleton is you know he's a perfectly good scholar of uh of 20th century thought and comes up initially with this enormous list of uh definitions of ideology and then goes through this entire book and there is not a single discussion of the origin of the term in the 18th century um and so um yeah i think it's worth just sort of saying from the outset that to, to go back to uh to go back to the 18th century is already unusual and it's a move that is uh it's not replicated among like other theorists of ideology in the in, in the 20th century so often mm -hmm. occasionally um so yeah I, ideology is uh, it's developed as a theory uh, in 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 the mid 18th century among uh, among uh, like progressive Enlightenment liberals, mm -hmm. effectively um, people who are uh, associated with the encyclopedia, mm -hmm. um, and the concern is simply this: um, we have a problem with reason which is that uh like reason might 
only be applicable normally to like fields of uh, knowledge and truth and where it meets uh, interest or prejudice or opinion uh, it, it it seems to be it seems to fail so like we often we describe in like specific interests or specific prejudices or opinions as, as sources of irrationality um the 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 project of ideology the original project of ideology is to say like, re reason can be expanded here so like and and, and this is where we get uh like this this very thematic development of the notion of interest in in the late 18th century um so like what does it mean to have rational interests this is like kind of like an adam smith question like it's like it, it's like every question of classical political economy is like do 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 subjects or do do actors within an economic system have rational interests it's the rousseau question like right you know what what are, what are my political interests and how does reason relate to them um uh, and so it, ideology appears out of uh, like out of this moment in which uh, there might be conflicting social groups, or certainly like those in power need to be questioned with reason. But right. the the reason with which they need to be questioned is not uh, it, it it doesn't is not apparent as like a, a, a an account of the whole, mm. but is an account of uh, like a, a partisan position within society. Mm. And so the question is like, can, can can I rationalize interests? Like, can I say, well, you know, you 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 have your own view, but like, what kind of reason is attached to this? Um, like, can I give an account of like why specific people have specific ideas? Like, mm -hmm. what does it mean for a particular person to have to use their reason particularly for mm -hmm. themselves? Um, I will add that there's like you know there there are there are I guess uh, like uh, wrinkles to this right so like it comes with uh, an epistemology so like the epistemology is uh, uh, this very like sensualist uh, uh, epistemology in which like the world is uh, the world is uh, like one of uh, like, firstly it's a world of vision. Right, it's a world that is uh, seen and intuited, and in in the intu intuitions of the world are all of the forces of power. Yeah. Right, so it has this like absolutely like commitment to the senses, um, as both the realm of like potential truth, or maybe not truth, but uh, of at least reason, yeah. and, like, particular reason and uh, and of power. Mm -hmm. um, and 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 as as well as uh, coming with an epistemology, it also comes with something like a social program, mm. right? So like the the thought behind all of this is that if if we can really give an account of like, why different people in different positions for different reasons that want want or think different things, right? then we can use the science of ideology, this discovery of the reasons for people's ideas to like create a rational society mm -hmm. uh, that we can balance, that we can, we can make those interests which might have previously been prejudicial. We can, we can like, make them transparent to themselves, mm -hmm. transparent mm -hmm. interests, and we can bring them into some kind of social harmony. Um, so like, these, these, I guess this is, these are the main points of the this 18th century version of the thought. Um, yes, yes. No, that's that's so um, that's perfect. And of course, when let's say we have the French Revolution, it, things become more interesting because, in a sense, uh, the radical elements of the demands of 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 the people, um, let's say, the position of the standpoint of, of the Jacobin uh, within the revolution in a sense have to be um, or, or rather are sort of transposed onto the new society that's built in the wake of the revolution with the same presuppositions of this idealistic sensualist based approach to thinking ideology. And so you can already see, I think immediately that that was a project destined to collapse. But then the question I think, from a Marxist point of view is, well, why, why did it 
collapse and what what then um in some sense or rather maybe we could say how did this transparent theory of ideology um not materialize right like why why would the, those who champion to further um equality egalitarianism liberal values and the universalism that's implicit in them why uh, what what were those destined to be kind of a fool's errand in bourgeois society in some sense <laughs> which is a tragic fact i mean it would be very nice uh, if 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 things did work that way right um right <laughs> if we had a cadre of bureaucrats sure. who could enforce universalism and and uh, uh, of course things get more i mean, I, I mean what, 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 the, the cadre of bureaucrats is is you know you're nothing short of uh like fourier here right so like the, what, what does enforced universalism look like mm. oh, it looks mm -hmm. it, it looks like the phalanstery right it looks okay. like this uh world of administration in which everyone has their own task um right so, <laughs> now, um, now we're getting now we're getting to adorno <laughs> right um i, I so um no i mean so I, I would say that the 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 collapse of this is uh there there are there are some like simple contingent historical facts mm. um and then there are like wider uh, philosophical issues um so in the like material sense the the main proponents of of like, ideology as a theory uh take up positions in uh in 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 the uh and National Institute in France, um, and they become increasingly critical of Napoleon as like you know not 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 just these sort of in in a strange way like liberal radicals, but of course like people further to the left of them are sure. also like very, very very critical of Napoleon. Um, and Napoleon does this thing, which is uh, like in some ways it's like I, I i kind of find it funny because it's it's been like the reflex since napoleon is is when you're questioned by like radical academics you just shut down the school right mm. uh, and and so this is uh and you know there's a long 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 history of time yeah, shutting down even, university, even, right? even 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 of um if you want to talk about france i'm sure you're familiar of the move the movement of the free spirits who who were actually in a sense uh i don't know if dissident is the right word but they were antinomian antinomian academics right, right. Who, who and and antinomian is a perfect word because they codified a social contract which was like the yeah. what the 180 of the existing one in some sense right. so it was kind of maybe a bit hysterical but but perhaps but but nonetheless uh revolutionary gesture uh, th there's a great book on this um these kind of communist and anarchist um antinomian movements in the middle ages and during the feudal period um by Cohn that i would re i threw my back out once and just had so much time to read i just read the whole thing it was so good yeah, but anyways, so I, was, I was i was reading a book where they they came up uh a, a couple of weeks ago which is a uh, Oh, I can't quite remember what it's called, but it was a a, a book on theories of narcissism. But that's a uh, that's another story for another time. There's also that the wonderful Van Eigen book on on these. Uh, yeah, of course. <laughs> and of course you have, uh, well, I, you know, it's interesting. We talk We're going to get distracted. Yeah, we don't. Um, we don't. We don't want to go down that track. <laughs> there that, well, there was that whole debate in the sort of Marxist German milieu during the time of adorno which was uh also going on in the soviet period which is from a marxist standpoint of historical materialism what do we make of feudal peasant revolts right, right. Engels opens that with his text on the peasant revolt but the important point is someone like lukacs even in the early 1960s referred to ernst bloch's uh the Münzer book the Münzer book as an idealist book which i felt was actually a very poor uh, claim on on lukacs's part because it's it's a it's a useful uh my german's not good enough to 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 really get into it but i know 
enough about it to say that this is a useful endeavor uh, uh, on Munzer. But we are getting off track now. Yes. Um, let us yeah, we're very off track. Sorry. So yeah. I was giving I was giving this immediate like uh, the immediate history of what happens to the sure. ideologues, right? The, so they have the the political and moral sciences, and that's called. literally that's literally what they're called, the ideologues. Right. So this was yeah. They, this is kind of what they call themselves, which, right, uh, <laughs> which is such a pejorative now. <laughs> right. Uh, and so, 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 so Napoleon just puts an end to, puts an end to it. He just shuts down the the effectively the university department, and that's it. Um, so like these people are um, without power, uh, and so um, like I think there's. I guess a more complicated question, um, which is uh, what happens to these ideas? Um, and yeah, uh, the so so the reason why a, a theory of ideology is important to them initially is because you need some kind of theory that is going to politically and philosophically account for the relations between like the part and the whole between mm -hmm. particularity and universality and uh like, quite obviously this is not a question that continues to concern uh napoleon in quite the same way like mm -hmm. uh his concern over like partial uh parts of the population their interests and their views is uh it's, it's not critical to mm -hmm. like what napoleon becomes like mm -hmm. pretty quickly right yeah, because that's that's a good point. I mean, if you think about someone like Victor Cousins, the the Napoleonic philosopher who put forward this notion of the uh, the good, the true, the beautiful, the three spheres of of bourgeois liberal civic life that must be thought of as a harmonious whole, right, and reinforced as a harmonious whole. He's a good example, I think, of uh, a recurring theme in liberal thought. Let's say. Which is which is which is the necessity, in fact, to reaffirm society as a uh, as a, and you talk about this in your commentary on on the essay we're discussing as a, a well composed organ machine, right? right? An organ machine without inflammation, right? An organ machine which is healthy, <laughs> yes. and the, right. the function of the ideologue is to ensure the health of the organs in some sense. Uh, so you can see immediately if the ideologue, the ideologue has this profound power, in fact, if if you think about it, um, intellectual. I mean, it's it's a very fascinating history. I mean, I don't know. I haven't studied much of what happened. Well, the first thing that comes to mind, by the way, is is the importance of American. So you see, after 1848, a similar thing happened because all of those uh, bureaucrats and intellectuals who were forced with the decision, do I stand with the workers or do I stand with a ruling class during the 1848 uprising? Yes. Well, many of them left and came to United States, the U.S. Yeah, of course. Yeah. That's why they call them the 48ers. Uh, so it's very similar. I mean, they're, they're probably not uh, technically ideologues in this sense, no. but they have the same class position. And in an interesting way, if we even fast forward to today, in maybe some sense, you could call them the the professional managerial class. I mean, in, in a set, well, not exactly, but you see my point. They were in a contradictory relationship there um, as intellectual workers, right? Right. So there's there's much to be said about that, I feel. Yes. Yeah, I mean, and, well, I mean, th th this is the other complicating factor. And and, and I guess, you know, Adorno is also uh, relatively strict about this when he discusses this in this this question in uh, the lectures which is that this is a theory that is kind of cooked up on the cusp of industrial society right and um the, the thing that happens in between is uh, industrial revolution and and uh, of course by the time the ideologues in, in 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 france are doing this work there's an industrial revolution going on in in britain mm. um within decades like this is happening in france as well mm. and has a slightly different history agriculture has a different history industry has a different history in france um but non nonetheless like by the time of 48 industrial production has become like a, a mode of 
world making, right? Mm -hmm. um, uh, as we know from Marx, um, mm. and, and certainly, like even even if you like, read Hegel, you can see the traces of this like, other movement that's happening, other but related movement. Um, yeah. So, so I, I guess like what what one of the question one of the questions becomes like how much can I like, think? Uh, what is kind of you almost like a, a like a rustic uh, like rustic rustic french 18th century theory against like uh urban industrial production um and so that th this complicating question uh mm. what happens to the ideologues well there's like kind of no longer a place for uh like an 18th century style political theorist mm. anymore in the 19th century mm. um like that that role gets usurped in some way um and like as you see, like if you if you like look 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 for people who like try to write sort of pure political theory in that mode in the in the nineteenth century, like you end up mm -hmm. you know you end up with someone someone like I don't know John Stuart Mill or uh, James Mill, in fact, right? You end up with this sort of just reflections of industrial production uh, in yeah. your thought. Um, and so um, yeah, I would just say like this is. Uh, uh, yeah, that's to be wary of right that 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 this idea of something like a a realm of like pure political discourse just evaporates. In Absolutely, a very radical way. That's very that's uh, very helpful. Yeah, and this this of course draws me to to the association of false consciousness, right. uh, ideology as false consciousness, which um really is the the um one early tendency of marxist theory of ideology um although i'm 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 not sure if false consciousness as a as a concept has a prehistory from from marx and engels um it does yeah it does, it, yeah uh, the the strange so the crucial text on the idea of false consciousness is this letter that engels sends to franz mehring in uh, 1893 so it's like it's incredibly late engels um uh, Mehring, who is uh, like he's Mehring is is like a chief like literary critic, and literary thinker of the Second International, right? And has uh, sent uh, Engels his book on Lessing, and Engels writes back and uh, in response uh, like gives an account of like what he thinks false consciousness is and what the role of ideology is and like, what it means for there to be uh independent spheres of say philosophy law uh religion uh that are producing in the world of ideas independently of the world of production um and so there is yeah there is absolutely a like although and and, and his claim is like engels makes the claim that this is a thought that marx had as well but which they had never emphasized enough because they had been uh, like too emphatic about uh the economic basis of society alongside that was also this thought that there were these like uh, quasi autonomous realms of thought uh and like quasi autonomous is quite the question right like how autonomous are they um but yeah certainly engels makes this argument uh in in the 1890s um and and then false consciousness is thematically taken up uh, right. most importantly by lukacs right right that's very helpful yes in um in in engels's uh reflections on ideology one does uh, i think for for reasons having to do with engels's own position within the class struggle as a promoter of um socialist doctrine and marxist points of view one sees that engels champions um what jan raymond calls a sense of ideological power and that um, uh, in Engels, more research needs to be done precisely about how ideology is understood as a mode of socialization. Uh, Engels uses the phrase of ideological power from below, which of course is taken up, I think, in very important ways by by, by postcolonial thinkers, decolonial thinkers, etc. So there's there's I feel that there's a lot of work because of course. Um, a lot of what Marxist critique of ideology comes from is is capital, right, and and commodity fetishism, and and so on. Whereas 
I wonder what you think about this this kind of so so if the ideologues are destined to 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 sort of collapse their legitimacy and so on that doesn't that doesn't mean that I don't know like a working class ideology from below would would also be destined to be defunct or would be destined to be uh, foolish uh, or something like that no in fact Engels wants to say that this is this is absolutely necessary and then you get into the problem of the Weltanschauung, right and the, yeah. the 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 whole question of the standpoint of the proletariat and so on and so on i mean i think we can pose the question in a you know, i'm always a fan of trying to do things crudely um or at least at first crudely and hopefully we'll go through some complexity and get back something crude For at sure. the end right um, i love that um like you know we can we can just ask the question like what does thought matter like what does consciousness matter for for Marx, you know, yeah. like where does this matter and why? Um, like, why is it important? Um, and 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 then like the other question is like, why does partisanship matter? Like, what does it mean to identify yourself, say, not as a not 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 as a class that's produced by society but to have self-identity with this class to say like mm. you know i have like class consciousness right mm. um like i think with my class and then of course in marx this is going to be like complicated insofar as like the class that takes up this particular role uh is going to be the class that abolishes class right that that then like looks like it might usher in the new realm of universality or at least and might end the dialectic between uh universal and particular in a, in a very radical way absolutely um, and, yes and so uh, this is, this the is, same this is the is... problem with the french revolution as well right and the yes. Italian question right okay. um the the right. one of the problems here is that we have uh, an account made from the point of view of the part on the like on partisan or party lines mm. um from a position that looks like it's just going to radically dissolve like partisanship and so in marx it gets dissolved in the name of uh or is to be dissolved in the name of like solidarity right and yeah. collective production right um yeah because like you're, you're making people, people right yeah you're, um, you're making such a great point which i feel like we we haven't said yet which is the reason the ideologues cannot um, achieve the harmonious society is due to the persistence of antagonisms and contradictions for which their uh, conception of society could not could not adequately account for. Yeah, and and um, I mean, I would add to this that also like one one of the real problems with the, the 18th century version of the thought hmm. is that it doesn't have a proper account of antagonism. Yes. So. Yes. Um, someone like napoleon is just like napoleon has many flaws right um by the way it's an endless joke in which you know no one in the 19th century thinks that napoleon has any flaws everyone wants to be like napoleon right in the 20th century everyone's like yeah, napoleon most flawed guy ever right and and the 21st century the jury's still out right uh, um so um like napoleon at least has a sense of class antagonism a very very strong sense of of, of class antagonism which this, this like very like kind of fluffy liberal theory right. uh, just doesn't account for it just says oh well you know maybe we have some opposing interests and maybe we can bring them into line with each other but, and napoleon yeah. is like no 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 like the, the, these classes are like literally at war with each other um, well, that, that's actually a beautiful point but nowhere nowhere in the i guess my question is this is sort of at what point does this wider project of ideology once it becomes instantiated in the in the bourgeois state at what point does does it does its um blind spots result in the notion which adorno talks about a lot that ideology becomes a veil precisely a veil and i love that image um um of concealment hmm? Uh, to me, this is this is how we even I would say intuitively think of what ideology is, right? Yeah. And that's that's good. Yeah. That's that's correct, right? Um, because it's so familiar to us. But then you but then you have raised a philosophical debate about the nature of what's being veiled. Yes. <laughs> for which for which 
Uh, you then have, I wish to say, a theological question about things of suffering and theodicy and so on, which we don't need to get into that. But maybe my question to, to bring us back to this wonderful thread here, when does it become a veil, I would say, or sort of how does this, this notion yeah. kind of kind of emerge in some sense? Okay. Does this make sense? Yeah, yeah, it does. Absolutely. Um, so I guess I like I have a view on this. I don't know if it's a particularly like, I, I don't know enough about these debates to know like whether what I'm going to say is like totally heterodox. So I'm going to tell you what I think. Um, but part of this goes back straight into the 18th century. Um, it, and like may, maybe like having written a commentary on this essay, I sort of tried to include some discussion of this problem. Um, it's, it, it's maybe like instructive to compare what uh, these 18th century French like sensualist views do with like Kantian critical philosophy. Yeah. Um, so in Kantian critical philosophy, you know, we have, we do have a world of essences and appearances, right? And uh, appearances are sort of structured by the subject for itself. Um, but there's certainly a problem in within these uh, like Kantian frameworks of uh, any the intuition in itself, so an intuition of the world having like meaning or bindingness um, so, like one one of Kant's major projects is to say, like people who think this is they're, they're, they're in some way like uh, they they've either made a mistake about metaphysics, right? They've made a mistake about the, the, the nature of the mind and what the mind can know. So, like these people are like kind of foolish. Um, they are they're attributing meaning where like none can be made without a whole lot of cognitive work. Yeah. Uh, um, or so 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 there's like this distance from in intuition right as a, a as a basis for like understanding the world in critical philosophy um among the ideologues it's like the opposite so you have like this world of uh of semblances right in which like all power all meaning is at stake already in this like pretty visual world right um in Kant, there's like this strong sense of like uh, there's a strong sense in which uh, an appearance, I mean, is just not the thing itself. Right? I think mm -hmm. right. Mm -hmm. It is some kind of veil. Uh, it is uh, like what we can make for ourselves in order to comprehend and to, to cognize. It's like precondition of cognition. Um, the the ideologues don't have this problem. Mm. Uh, and so, like, maybe maybe I can put this in like more Marxist terms. Um, like, uh, the ideology exists in the sphere of appearances, like already, mm -hmm. right? And and that sphere of appearances is both a place of judgment and a place of prejudice. It's a place that uh, encompasses like the the intuition is a like universal manifold. Like there is no political power outside of this like apparent world, mm. um, so it really is kind of universal, even if it doesn't have the bindingness of universality that we have in say Kant. Um, but like, so this is this is the account the ideologues are going to give: is yeah. a world in which like appearance kind of means everything. Um, right. Uh, for like most people, after that, um, this is not the case, right? So. Mm have a sense of say uh like social processes which uh are like made to appear in a certain way mm -hmm. right that that what might be forceful is not necessarily apparent um and so like we find this in hegel and we find this in marx uh in strong senses we find it too in nietzsche uh of course and in freud um but there's uh yeah, so like if if I, if I say to you, um, oh, you know, I was, I was joking with some friends this week. I was talking about like what happens when you eat an apple, 
and you're like, oh, yeah, I'm just eating this apple. And like, you're like, well, what, what, what form is it? And you're like, well, it's an apple. And then you sort of ask the question harder. You're like, what form is it? It's, it's a global division of labor. Like, it's got all of the entire history of labor and capital and like the capital's relation to other social systems built into it. It's got, you know, both the like very immediate people who like grew the tree and picked it and, uh, uh, and it's also got like all of human relations to nature built mm. into it. And then I'm like, but it's an apple, right? Mm. Um, <laughs> like, needless to say, like we have this problem. Um, we have a problem within uh, like the world in which like motives, at least, are not like necessarily apparent. Uh, mm. <laughs> Yes, and, like, the work of making them apparent really is a work of like stripping away appearances. Um, yes, um, and like you know, I can I can do this kind of like, joke Marxist critique about uh, like what a commodity is. Of course, you know this like pantomime of the commodity, mm. um, but it's also like got this very serious point behind it, which yeah. is, which is that uh, something like exploitation, mm. right? The fact that like my labor and your labor and everyone else's labor is taken from them and not put to use in fulfilling our needs but is put to use in uh in like the accumulation of profit yeah um like this is not apparent right yeah. this is not what work looks like uh all the time it's kind of what it looks like some of the time of course but um like <laughs> People who think that like this is like an intuitive view of the, like Mark, Marx does not have an intuitive view of the world, or if he does have an intuitive view of the world, it's a very very strange one because it involves uh, like supernatural powers, mm -hmm. right? Or it involves uh, so so yeah. I will I, I will just put it like that: that the ideologues are because of it because of they are because they are sensualist, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because they think power belongs in the realm of appearance. Mm um like they also lead directly into this idea of like a world of kind of changeable appearances change like cha changeable politics yeah and that might have been thematic for, for for the 1780s right um like, yeah is this, it, this, is, this is, is thematic good. now for yeah. a, a world in which like like we still have like the domination of like effectively industrial capital for like mm -hmm. 200 years yeah um, this is a, this is good. This is good. I mean, it's interesting to me that you raise Kant in the sense that there's a lot of research looking at Kant's politics that interests me a lot because yeah. he is so often thrown under the bus as um, I don't know, simple sense, a kind of new iteration of a liberal ideologue in a way. Right. But in but in point of fact, Kant was opposed to merchant capitalism as he encountered it in his time and that furthermore the short essays that Kant wrote on things like um, international peace yeah. or even on um, his notion of the of Kant's ethics of categorical imperative there's a big debate that interests me a lot about um, whether uh, it kind of splits Marxist and liberal Kantians in some sense uh, you know what I mean it, whether um, the, the sort of existing social relations are what is um, processed as the unchangeable sort of dimension of the imperative or whether um, there must be some kind of um, imminent critique or distance from the existing social relations because I feel that a liberal Kantian is completely fine to, to actually not address certain existing social antagonisms of capitalism, right? Mm -hmm. uh, whereas, whereas we do have, uh, we do have a Kantian Marxist tradition, in fact, with people like Lucien Goldman and uh, Kojin Karatani and others who, who say, no, 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 you're misreading Kant. And then of course, Domenico Lucerto has an untranslated book about Kant's reading of the French Revolution, where he shows that Kant was censored uh, 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 regarding his support for Robespierre, hmm? for his okay. support for the yeah. for the most radical elements of the revolution. Hmm? Yes, 
Uh, because if that was true, <laughs> then then the whole reception of Kant's insights philosophically would mean something very because, different politically. Right? I guess the problem is that Kant was being censored for uh, other things as well, right? For, uh, for, oh, should the racism? Uh, uh, no, no, well, no, 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 but he was he, at the time was being censored for uh, like religious over religious questions. Sure. Um, sure. Yeah. Oh, in, so this in the 1790s, yeah. Yeah. and so like working out quite what Kant is being censored for is a is going to be a, a well that a, whole that whole category thing. when you study like um the German idealists, it is it is it is important to remember that um they the the young Hegelians were 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 brutally censored. That's right. that's part of the reason why Marxism came about in yes. some sense. Yeah. Uh, because it hit ho so ho so close to home for these thinkers, um, yeah. Uh, okay, so this is very good. So so very good. So so the Kantian um, notion of the uh, noumenal of um, the unknowability of the thing in itself plays a very important role, but it doesn't account for um, the heart of the of the true contradictions of the division of labor. Now Adorno. Mm -hmm really puts a big onus on the division of labor um, um, in the in his whole conception of what ideology is. Yes. Um, and we, we were talking before the show about another maybe fellow traveler of Adorno, uh, Alfred Sunrettel, in his book on um, the division between intellectual and manual labor. Yes. Um, which is a controversial, a controversial intervention, but nonetheless, a rigorous and important one in Marx's yes. thought, nonetheless. Um, could you, could you perhaps bring us now to Marx and ideology? I know we've kind of, we have a sort of chronology going here. I haven't lost it, I, I hope. No, no, no. We've, it's not we've gone, but, I mean, we could talk about Hegel, but I think we can talk about Hegel through Marx. So let's yes. just sort of start there. Instead of because we touched on angles and stuff like that, but maybe let's say okay, sort of how does the Marxist critique of ideology maybe maybe emerge in some sense? So, well, I, I mean, this is this is already going to be a, a a complicated question because there's a um, so there's there's a problem. Uh, okay, maybe, maybe I'll, I'll go back go back one step which is just to say something briefly about Napoleon that I didn't touch on, um, which is of, of critical importance. So today, if I say that ideology, um, this has this like tremendously uh, like pejorative connotation. Mm. I apologize for the cats in the background. Um, so uh, like I, could, I, I can criticize something as ideology. I, I can say, well, you know, um, someone might say, "Well, uh, you know, I'm, 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 uh, I, 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 Britain is a like cohesive country, um, and and therefore I like ought to be a nationalist." And I, and I could say, "Well, this is you know, this is just ideology, right? It, it's uh, so this this strong sense of of, of someone uh, like talking nonsense or." Mm -hmm. uh, uh, Simply speaking, in, in, in prejudices or in uh, some kind of unreasonable way, um, right? Like affirming a, a sort of social truth, um, right. um, which is um, which which they which they can't see as as riddled right. with, with with contradictions and right. lies and so on and so forth. Um, yeah. And uh, so th this sense of ideology is as like a pejorative, as an accusation against. Uh, against someone else right this is this is from napoleon so napoleon um that makes this a, attack on the ideologues and mm. like so his attack on them like, accusing the ideologist of being like caught in this like uh, clouded world right this this is the origin of this sense of ideology and mm. um both Marx and like, most Marxists after Marx mm. uh, take on like, this strong sense of uh, like, ideology as irrational, as something that needs to be criticised. Um, and so like, 
Uh, yeah, I would say that this is this is sort of like yeah, it's, it's peculiar, right? That that you end up with Marx and late Napoleon on the same side of this. Um, <laughs> uh, it's not 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 your expected view of the nineteenth century, especially but, um, especially given Marx was such a staunch, uh, right, despiser of Bonapartism. Uh, yeah, right. Um, um, but yeah, I, I guess it's just important to put out that put out there that there's. There is this strong, like this strong sense of the condemnation of ideology has its mm. roots in Napoleon, um, and 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 Marx basically adopts this wholesale, right? So this becomes uh, so what what we get in Marx is often uh, an account of uh, of a world of appearances that is deceptive, right? We have. Uh, uh, an account often let's say we take the uh uh the 1840s work uh we have an account of like people who spend their lives playing in in the world of appearances too much mm -hmm. or in the, not not just in the world of appearances but in the world of thought so like if if, if i take say like the critiques of feuerbach from the 1840s mm -hmm. and german ideology like the accusation is simply this right that that uh feuerbach like he um like he wants to solve the problem of bad thinking with good th like with right thinking or like uh right thinking that includes materialism but like it's only a thought materialism right so he so Fe feuerbach like feuerbach of course is accusing uh like the idealists of uh he's accusing idealists he's accusing like people who remain uh, religious and he says you know you think badly like what you need is to think like uh, humanistically like you have to mm -hmm. think with the human at the center you have to kind of think materialistically um and yet it's still thinking and and, and marx makes this criticism and says well <laughs> you know feuerbach has kind of fallen into this contradiction here which is that he wants a materialism but he only wants one that's thought Mm. Like it, it remains at the level of contemplation, mm -hmm. um, and so it also ceases to be as materialist as Feuerbach would want, and it ceases to be as humanist as Feuerbach would want as well. In fact, it turns out to be a sort of like human, uh, like ideas based compensation for the loss of religion, um, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, and so, so ideology takes on this like uh, aspect of uh, like things that remain in the realm of thought they uh, take on an aspect of compensation of, of maybe psychological compensation or social compensation um and, and we will see this like, throughout marx mm -hmm. um in terms of the division of labor uh i think this is this is kind of complicated uh how this comes to relate to ideology um and i'm like, I'm not convinced that we can make a full theory of this with Marx alone. Mm. Uh, Marx is a good starting point, but it's going to be the early 20th century and people like Lukács who are going to like make a, a particularly like strong argument on this. Certainly, uh, in 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 Marx of Capital, we have a setup that says, well, there's like certain modes of social intercourse right we have relations of production we are like, people are involved in like making the world including making themselves and having a world which makes them mm -hmm. right and, and then there are like forms of thought like necessary thought that uh, are also produced in this process sometimes these are like thoughts about the world and sometimes they are thoughts about each other sometimes they are thoughts that govern or that seem to govern the relations between people but you know might might not actually be doing that governing um so so for example like if i think of uh, value as an abstraction right it looks like the thought of value is what like mediates exchange mm. right and of course it's not right it, of course there's, there's, there's like a situation of violence there's a situation of of, of work there's a, a situation of expropriation there are like genuine material relations in the world that's produced and and this kind of gets covered over with this concept of value 
And so it looks like I, I exchange, you know, uh, two bushels of wheat for however many dollars. Mm. Um, so like, there's a sense in which, uh, like all of this is not resolvable, uh, in like, the world of thought alone. Like I can't solve this issue that mm. Mark sets up by thinking more rightly about it. Mm. Um, like it <laughs> requires something different from this. Um, like I've, you know, I, one thing I'm going to say about the division of labor is this. Um, the division of labor is an Adam Smith concept, right? Mm -hmm. It's a kind mm -hmm. of concept. It's, it's absolutely like a, a, a classical political economy concept. And, and, and what, it's, what it does there is it describes uh, like the processes of material and mainly industrial production, uh, but also agricultural production. Um, in Marx, often the division of labor is kind of doing the same is set doing the same sort of work right it remains in this form of uh of uh classical political economy um there's not to say that marx is not like critical of this but um that in the 20th century when marxists come to this so people like lukacs people like adorno um like one of the peculiar things about the division of labor is it's it's used as an explanation of like why some people work with their bodies and some people work with their minds <laughs> right um uh, 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 and it's like very clear to me that in 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 Marx, um, like there isn't this particularly strong sense that uh, like the bourgeois class, the the class of like factory owners, or of financiers, or of uh, like you know, pe pe people who are heading up corporations, there's not a, there's not a very strong sense that they're working at all, mm -hmm. um, right? Mm -hmm. they, 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 they don't, you know, it's Cert certainly like one of the things that happens in Marx is that workers uh like workers are in some ways like prohibited from uh thinking in certain ways mm. they're not prohibited from thinking in general mm. um but yeah this version of it that we get in in in, in say like 20th century Marxism in which like somehow like the bourgeoisie are also subject to the division of labor and this is a like a description of uh all of human conduct mm. um this is it, it, it's like peculiar to me mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm, because mm -hmm. this is not what we find in Marx. Mm -hmm. um it then becomes very important right so this becomes in 20th century marxism uh, a description of like, the division of the mind and the body it becomes uh, a description of not only the separation of different types of work the fact that like you know some people might work in car plant and 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 and, and some people might like, work in shop and mm -hmm. like even within the car plant some person might might just be doing like welding of one particular joint and like another person will be like spraying paint in a particular place and and that work becomes uh, like more uniform uh like the process of work becomes like increasingly repetitious um and like as those tasks are divided up uh like the interests well perhaps the interests of people but certainly like uh people people firstly become like removed from anything like the final finished product of work um but the also the um like it, it it's possible that say uh like different parts of manufacture within a single plant might like start to have discrete interests mm -hmm. um so that is one of the threats of the division of labor mm -hmm. is that if, if you're all very removed from the finished product product it's it's like increasingly diff difficult to like make a collective claim on it mm -hmm. um mm -hmm. so i think this is this is very helpful and i i feel i feel that uh in a sense, ideology, because um, there's two things I wish to say here. One is, I like I like the first set of reflections you said about early Marx regarding what we might call what what, what uh, Kojin Karatani I think is the um, was the architecture metaphor where it's like from below and on high. So in Brumaire, it's the proletariat is the old mole. Yes, and the 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 motif of the mole is yes. or the hidden abode of production, right? Yes, uh, uh, which we could even draw a, a link to capital itself, and talk about this fetishistic theological substratum that we that 
that but I think the difference though is that those insights apply beyond the class uh, nexus in some yeah. sense yeah so there's that important uh, point I think the other important point is uh, how do the class positions and the division of labor um, relate to the question of the social totality um, which becomes extremely significant and I think what frankly and correct me if you see differently drove uh, Adorno in a way to give these lectures precisely because Weber and Mannheim were putting forward a theory of ideology and relationship or, or they had a conception of ideology as a totality that he felt was completely ignorant of Marx's insights apropos the question of to social totality right. and so um so I know that's a lot, but I guess it's interesting to me to to say that, okay, yeah. well, in some sense, a revolutionary proletarian position, according to Lukács, has a privileged access point to the totality, precisely. Um, and that's a claim that Lukács puts forward um, in the standpoint of the proletarian history class consciousness, which we could we can we can see what someone like Adorno might say in response to to that claim, but let's not get there yet. Let's take, go back and ask: um, How does the social totality fit into the division of labor? Would you say, or the kind of um, no, the knowability of it, and so on? Yeah, I mean, so this is this is a sort of highly contested question, as a, as I understand it. Um, because because the issue is going to be an issue of of like value in Marx and the nature of value, mm. um, and how do I put this? I'm I'm aware that for the last uh, fifty sixty years there has been a certain school of Marxists that is like insistent that basically everything in Marxist philosophy, philosophy is like solvable by way of an account of a value which then in turn structures the social totality mm -hmm. which uh, then becomes a, like an explanation of, of society um value for um, Marxism yeah right um and like cer cer certainly this is this is going to be an important argument uh, about like the nature of world markets in Marx um I, I'm, I, I'm not entirely convinced that this is what Marx is doing. Uh, like, it just seems to me that there's all sorts of other things happening in, in capital, uh, apart from anything else. There are, like, incredibly long descriptions of, like, the productive process uh, and of factory inspectors' reports and of, uh, 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 alongside, like, theoretical developments of uh, of value. And and so, like, we can only, like, to, to, to me, like, uh, you know, there's, there is this like strong like collage aspect of of, of capital and what it means to read capital um uh, in which like i might have the sorts of philosophical theses about uh about value that can give me like an account of the social totality but then i'm also you know going to get like stories and fables and mm -hmm. uh like anti-narrative ways of thinking or like philosophy and anti-philosophy uh on like how 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 to think about industrial production, um, right? And like and, and and so like this is me as you know someone with a, a a bit of a literary bent, right? More than you know, I'm not a philosopher. Um, however much I like deal with philosophical issues, um, I called you a philosopher in the introduction. My, yeah, yeah, my I mean, apologies. I, I, I have a tendency to do that. Yeah, and and so um, like my 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 sense is that like. There is, I would say, uh, like a weak claim to be made on yeah. the like, value form perspective, yeah. which which is that like forms of value do produce universe, like they produce some kind of like spurious universality, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So, like what you call a dollar is supposed to be what I call a dollar. It is supposed to like represent uh, like a unit of socially necessary labor time at its cheapest price. Like um, this thing called value is also like 
directly related to production in the world and is related to say uh, like the proportions of uh, industrial capital uh, or like fixed capitals variable capital etc cetera, etc cetera. like i can i can do this right mm -hmm. this is obviously not an explanation of the world right mm -hmm. but it's also like it, it's a weak form in which like we can describe a, a social totality in quite crude quite crude terms mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. however like despite it being a very weak form of the description of the totality it makes uh it makes this like it has this peculiar occurrence in marx because it, it relies on on thought um and like unlike mm -hmm. most other things in marx uh which don't necessarily rely on thought mm -hmm. and, and like, you know we can do, talk about zone rattle because zone rattle will say like uh where this thinking happens is like a question like does it happen between people does it happen in the act of exchange or right. does it happen like in my mind is it like a delusion that i have when i go to work every day or is it a social thing like you know we can discuss Mm -hmm. where that thought is but like the point is simply this which is that it is a thought um, yeah. Yeah. Um, and, and 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 so that the construction of the social totality if there is one comes out of this out, out of this in marx and like as i say it's spurious yeah and it's spurious precisely because it is only thought um and, and yeah mm-hmm and, and so mm. this this might be like the source of what we can call ideology in Marx. Um, I really like this. I just want to pose a couple clarifying questions and and thoughts of my own to see to run them through your to run them through you, if I may. Um, if we go back to Engels and we say that Engels, as a sort of pamphleteering uh, publicist of Marxism, although obviously a great theorist in his own right. Um, develops some notion of this, let's call it a kind of more engaged uh, problematic uh, of, of the of the question of the social totality in the sense that for the social totality, if, okay, if the proletarian position has an epistemic advantage to knowing something more about the social totality of bourgeois society, which I think is a claim that's going on here. The question for Adorno, writing in the in the in the wake of the Nazi moment, in some sense, or, or, or even concurrent to it, right, is that that epistemic advantage has 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 dwindled, is 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 no longer efficacious, right? So I wonder if you think that's true. Then the question is. Um, the, the the question of epistemic advantage and standpoint and and right. class and 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 no no and and yeah right um, and even I would say further sort of this value form conversation on the one hand mixed with this more Lukacian question of the social totality right I, so, I mean yeah please maybe 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 it's time to fill in some of the gaps Please. which is uh like the gaps that happen at the very beginning of the 20th century and like what's going on with the question of the social totality um and like why this is an important category um and like what what sociology thinks about this so one one, one thing that adorno will claim um at the very opening of his essay on ideology is that like what becomes of the ideologues in this like 18th century sense is uh, that they become sociologists right they become sociologists by one means or another and like we can think about like Comte uh, and like French sociology but like his immediate question is about German sociology mm -hmm. um and like in particular, he becomes uh, interested in uh, like uh, criticizing um, uh, the branch of sociology of his time uh, that, that that gets called in the nineteen twenties the sociology of knowledge. And I guess it's like a requirement that we fill in some background that there are in the in the like last decades of the nineteenth century and the uh, like first decades of the twentieth century there are the competing 
I guess I would call them like competing liberal uh, liberal arguments about method within the German Academy. Um, and like we're, you know, let's just come out of Marxism for a second. We're going to do like what the liberals, what the liberal academics think about the world, because this provides some important background. Um, not that it's hugely interesting, uh, like if I was to like recommend that people read anything, I would definitely recommend they read Marx and not like German neo-Kantians, um, unless you're like going to be a nerd. Um, like this material is, it's sort of important, but it's just like quite dull. But like what we get on the one hand is uh, like an attempt at uh, like doing sociology as a science, as though it's a natural science in which, uh, but its object is as like fragmented and broken up and like made into uh, like an object of knowledge as like any plant is under the gaze of like a scientist and that this is to be practiced without values. Um, so this is like one strong like, strand of liberal thought at this time uh, that is motivating for um for German sociology, and like, we kind of see something like this in Weber. Weber is like just Weber is an incredibly complex and uh, deep thinker, um, and like worth reading. Um, but like sure. this is uh, like one of the things that might be going on a bit mm. in yeah. Uh, like yeah. let's say this is like a ma major motivation of Weber right. is to do science, do, do sociological science uh, in 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 this mode. Um, and like one of the consequences of this is that these people who are interested in in like this type of study of sociology, uh, in which like the world is the like dissected object, um, is that they 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 all basically claim that there is no totality, or that if there is a totality, it's not of like importance and and it's not accessible to their science, mm. right? That their their science is an analytic one. Um, and this is the neo-Kantian piece, right? And so, like, this is this is like the strong neo-Kantian position. Well, it's one of the neo-Kantian positions, right? So, which is, other, which is where which is where Lukács right. was was trained, right? right. And 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 and, and uh, uh, the other things that are, are going on at that time is is in, in Germany at least is a uh, is is a trend kind of in the other direction in uh, although like among like related people who are you know often in conversation is uh it, it, it is the grouping around like what gets called geisters wissenschaften which ugh, you have to kind of translate as human sciences or humanities right but uh, like people like del mm -hmm. who are like literary and cultural theorists who are like trying to give an account of like what what human values mean for right like, this is the neo hegelian side yeah. right right um although then they're also like not straightforwardly neo hegelian because right. like, lots of them have been trained in a kantian academy and mm -hmm. like, some of them are trying to do like what hegel did with kantian concepts mm -hmm. um mm -hmm. and so like if you think about someone like uh ricker right yep. for this, mm -hmm. like south german uh neo kantian who like is more attached to uh, mm -hmm. like this Geister's Wissenschaft and stuff, the values question. Mm -hmm. um, uh, he's he's just like he's just kind of a, a Kantian. Um, mm -hmm. He's not like recognizably Hegelian mm -hmm. in any sense. Um, right. But the, these people want to ignore the neo Hegelian position would affirm that some Weltanschauung um, um, is knowable or mm -hmm. and and right right inhabitable and so on and so on right and and, and, and so this becomes uh, like it has various transformations in in these first decades of the 20th century we get what gets called like leben's philosophy like the yeah. philosophy of life uh, yeah. and forms of life and styles of life we get vitalism animal, right. like various types of vitalism uh, and, and like these are these are crucial debates uh, and and then we get lukacs in the middle of, of of this and he is part of uh, like at least in the 1910s, um, I mean, Lukács is something on his own. Like Lukács is just like one of the like fantastically great thinkers of the 20th century, mm. uh, and like worth reading. Do you like, think he's the, Do you think he's the greatest thinker of the 20th century? Who knows? Who knows? I mean, <laughs> oh, I think that, you know, I know no, I hate those questions. No, I, no, I, I mean, I, I think the global proletariat is the greatest thinker of the 20th century, and uh, like. Uh, 
and I call great great thing because it comes with their flaws, right? And uh, <laughs> no, but Luke Hatch is, is is something different, and uh, but but this is the context in which he's writing, yeah. and he's going to make a historical argument about uh, like uh, the nature of uh, the totality and modernity. He's going to uh, like if I think about the, his book, the theory of the novel, mm. um, like what we get is an account of uh like what well, he begins is with integrated totalities mm. with uh like romantic notion quasi-romantic notion of a world in which like the totality and the individual are in like, harmony because they are powered by the same like force and fire right and then he's going to read uh modernity as a process of that disintegration which nonetheless remains total so something like the development of prose right or the importance of the prosaic in life uh in the novel it is not to say that the totality breaks apart but that the, the, the totality is disintegrated like it's disarticulated and it has certain types of fractures in it which have consequences for language it has consequences for values it has consequences for like uh, religion um uh, and and, and so like Lukacs is a very strong thinker of, of the totality right like uh, so that's important to have that like the the people who Adorno is immediate like Adorno becomes an enormous fan of Lukacs so like if you like, read Adorno's letters from the 1920s you can find him in 1925 writing to Alban Berg the composer who was his teacher saying you know I am you know, absolutely committed to like this new like Marxist philosopher who I've just read, Lukacs. Uh, mm. the, it, it, uh, and Lukacs's book, History and Class Consciousness, which uh, is published in the early 20s, um, it has just this transformative uh, mm. effect for a generation of, well, not only a generation of Marxist intellectuals, like basically all, all Mar Marxist intellectuals since. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, but let's just put Lukacs to, a side, to the side right now. Like the, the crucial thing is that there's a fight going on between like the people who say that the totality is like everything is is describable, even in its like disarticulation, mm. even in its disintegrating state, mm. um, and the people who say like no, right, like no totality. And so like Ve like you know, Weber is is you know he's kind of the chief criminal here but he's not just that because i think there's more going on in 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 weber but like if i was to run like weber against lukacs like weber in his thinking about disenchantment mm. right and so weber has this this if you if you read like protestant work ethic like the argument is about a history of disenchantment you get the sense in which like the world is fragmenting and breaking up and like all that science can do is like take hold of the parts of it mm. right um, like the, the consequence of disenchantment of the like loss of God, loss of religion, uh, like, uh, like the kind of uh, isolation of human life um, is uh, 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 and uh, like the like seemingly like semi natural forces in society is it, it, it is that like we can just account for the parts like that is the best we can do given this context mm -hmm. and that like, on the other side we're going to have people like Lukacs and Adorno who say like no hang on mm -hmm. like this breakdown of things like it does not end here it doesn't it doesn't like resolve into like this endless fragmented partiality but like it maintains a certain type of total form mm -hmm. um like this is going to be a difficult total form because it's an antagonistic and fragmented and like broken total form. It's one in which like the parts don't speak to each other in like normal, normal languages mm. um, or like might be forced to speak to each other in a language of values that is deeply inappropriate to any one part. Mm. But like, you know, and, and here we are back in the division of labor. Like what is it about, for example, like welding a car that makes a dollar appropriate to it? Hmm. right and yet of course like the welding of a car is made to speak in the language of dollars hmm. right <laughs> um, and and so so you know 
I, I just wanted to like give this intellectual history just to kind of give an account of like what why why some of this process might be <laughs> yes like, important background to like the philosophy that's going to happen yeah i wonder if i could read a little passage from the yeah. tor towards the end of adorno's essay yeah. which, which references uh this question of of totality i think it hopefully is going to dovetail nicely with what you are what you are saying um it says Quote, if one were to define the legacy of ideology as the totality of all intellectual products, which today occupy the consciousness of people to a great extent, then one may understand by this less an autonomous mind deceived about its real social implications than a totality of what is manufactured in order to capture the masses as consumers and, if possible, to model and fixate their state of consciousness. So uh, it's kind of nice. I mean, he because he says quite, quite um, starkly, quite dramatically yeah. that the category of experience and consciousness is going, undergoing a profound alteration such, and he says that this is uh, uh, an alteration from, a, um, uh, from the standpoint of political economy between base and superstructure yes. that has, has, has fundamentally... Um, become the the old way of ideology is now illegible is no longer sensical in some sense so I'm, uh the way that the, the way that the the that, that adorno sort of state states that at the end of of the essay that you translated it was so um stark to me i'm thinking here of benjamin's also his notion of the category of experience and it's what uh this this mutation in capitalism is doing to experience. I'm wondering if you could help us a little bit more, maybe historicizing this or sort of giving a bit of a uh, background as to why this, what permits Adorno to make such a grandiose claim about the deterioration of experience and about ultimately the notion which will will um, guide, I think, the the critique of culture industry of the notion of transparency. Right, that the essence of society, um, in all of its brutalism, that ideology doesn't doesn't, in fact, adequately, um, it, because social relations and their brutalism and their exploitation are now rendered so transparent in some sense, um, ideology doesn't have the same efficacy that it did. Yeah. Yeah. So, and of course, he also importantly, and I'll stop here, references um, totalitarianism and fascism. But that's not all that's that's not all that's uh, going on um, uh, that's brought us to this state. Or maybe it is. I don't know. How would you? Yes. I, I don't know if I'm jumping ahead. If I am, feel free to fill in gaps as you've been doing. throughout. Yeah. I mean, so, you know, we would, I mentioned very briefly before, when we were talking before recording this, that like one, one of the things that happens in, uh, in, in Adorno is that um, we so I'm just going to say that I, I'm not sure how important the uh, the category of ideology is for Adorno. Like it's it's clearly important enough that he is uh, like consistently concerned with it from the early 30s through to a lecture series in the 60s, and in fact, like there there is discussion of ideology in the late work, and it it provides a very like. Um, uh, uh, like it, it plays a very like specific role in Adorno's thinking, which is to give an account of the relationship between universality and particularity, mm. and that kind of sounds like an abstract uh, and, and philosophical problem, but it's also just like kind of a, a, a social problem, and it's a social problem that like social theory has been trying to deal with for uh, two hundred and something years. Mm. Like, how do I relate? Say, uh, like. Uh, the view or the interests of a part of society, the whole of society. Um, this is the sort of question that <laughs> um, the that the ideologists are asking as well. Um, and and so, like, what we find in Adorno is uh, often uh, like a great interest in uh, in experience. 
and the problems of experience. And so I was saying like, before the show that, um, that if you read the culture industry chapter of, uh, of Dialectic of Enlightenment, um, like, what you find is, is like precisely this like, totality versus, to totality versus like, anti-totality. Like, this, is, this is the setup of this chapter. That he begins by saying, like, sociology kind of tells us that everything is falling apart, right? Mm -hmm. that, that there is no totality anymore. And yet, when I like, look at the world, I see a world of integration. You know, I, like, my experience of the world is that it is unified, integrated. It is uh, in the appearance of things, like, repetitious. It duplicates itself. Um, it uh, uh like when i look at town planning like it looks repetitious it looks like it's all part of a unified whole like this doesn't look like a society that is disintegrating in the way that weber says that it might like this, the, the fact that every suburb on every american city kind of looks the same hmm. right this is like if this is the site of like the so-called disenchantment right the thing that disunifies and like forces us into an analytic mode like it is contradicted by experience um and and you know where, where this goes in, in goes in, in in a number of complicated uh directions in the culture industry chapter it, it becomes a question of like the style of uh of uh, like late capitalism it becomes a question of like what happens to tragedy and it becomes uh, like a question it increasingly becomes a question of uh, like the aesthetic products of of the capitalism of that age uh, which adorno is uh, takes as like crucial to experience or forming experience or, or of our expectations of experience um so let I, I guess this is to say that like uh, a question of aesthetics or a question of experience or a question of style is going to be crucial to Adorno. There's also like a philosophical level at which this operates. Um, so if I think about uh, like if if I think about uh, like the problem of ideology, um, like the argument will go that it absolutely affects experience right it, it is uh, in some way like blinding right and instead of like having an experience of the world what i get is an experience of like preformed rationalizations so yeah. like uh, and here we're sort of back in kind of in kant territory so like adorno has like a broad broadly kantian thought about like how we might think about form right that like in order to put anything to use or for it to operate in our world like we need some kind of sense of its form um that is like conditioned by judgments hmm. the problem is is that the judgments are presupposed right so the judgment is done for us by possibly some like external social motive um so like it's not the case that like i pick up my cup and i go you know it's a cup and that's like my thought but rather that like the definition of this as uh, as a cup like this forming work is done socially and it's done in a society which is like liable to form things against their will mm. and in mm. uh, like mm. might might cover over like uh, as we discussed with the apple earlier or like with labor or um you know it's likely to, to to cover over some of what's going on in the process of forming. Uh, in fact, like all of Adorno says, that all of our judgments suffer from being preformed. Mm. Um, but it's not just the matter that judgment is preformed, but experience itself is preformed. Yeah. Um, mm. And 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 you know, I, I I give an example in in in. Uh, in, in the commentary I wrote about, say, let's say, take, take like the prejudice of racism, um, because I think, you know, this, this can be illustrative, right? The problem of racism is not just that, like, I might judge someone 
uh, like make, make a bad judgment about someone hmm. because of the color of their skin. That the problem of racism is that I do not see them at all. And in their place, I see a preformed, like, irrational category that has been rationalized mm-hmm. right so it, it doesn't just operate on the level of judgment it mm. operates at the level of experience as mm. well mm. and so it's this sort of argument that we will find in adorno uh but you know magnified because the problem is not just like one of an individual prejudice but of like social prejudices mm. uh, social production and, and, and the problems of culture um so when you say when we look at this passage that says well like we have uh like the synthetic ident- identification by way of media like that's some of what's going on here like that's mm-hmm. some of the argument that's happening mm-hmm. um yeah i don't know you if can you see to... this is great and you can see exactly why to the larger point of why ideology loses its its luster or its even purchase power in 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 the society adorno is uh witnessing he says the intellect splits apart into a truth which is esoteric critical in that it externalizes itself from semblances and is alienated from the immediate social context and then this is the important one and then he says and the planned administration of that which was once ideology separates from that so in that sense ideology as it was is 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 distant to the subject in a way yes. uh so yeah yeah i think i think that's right i mean i, yeah. I so I, like i will add that, so you need uh, a, you need a new theory of ideology right so. i mean so like I, the one thing i will add is that like despite all of this despite the sort of uh what looks like an end of okay how do i may, maybe i should go back a step and just go like just slow myself down slightly if you go to uh i don't know like an american university right and you say like what do you learn of adorno the answer is this everything is ideology right this is this like grumpy german man right who uh like thinks that like humans kind of suck right Mm -hmm. who thinks that humans are just like wrong about everything (laughs) and that he knows better and like look at those masses out there with their ideology with their football with their pop music like what like why do they think like that who the hell are they right so i mean this is obviously has nothing to do with adorno um or at least like this is like it it, it, it's it's like so bad a a caricature that it's Mm -hmm. it's simply false and like just doesn't like adorno is not someone who thinks that one of the consequences of this sort of position is to say like we live in a world of imminence in which everything like around us is so entirely false that we cannot get a purchase on the truth yeah we are just like catastrophically lost in this world of ideology and like even if i can criticize the guy over there who's going to the football match for going to the football match i'm just as bad as him because mm-hmm. there is no way out like, adorno does not think this like i cannot say enough that like this version of adorno is simply wrong it's wrong philosophically it's wrong based on text it's just a like, poor interpretation and yet it's like the most popular reading of adorno among the people who don't read adorno mm-hmm. um mm-hmm. On the other hand, like we have this version of Adorno, which is like a theorist of the end of ideology. So like liberalism has kind of collapsed in one way or another. Uh, the liberal conditions in which like which are required for ideology, in which there might be like a balance of forces or a, even if it's a class war or like an ongoing class war, um, like instead you have like twin ends of ideology, one in like fascism. Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, the 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 violent fascism of national socialism and, and mm-hmm. concentration camps, um, and uh, and at the other end of li- uh, of of like liberalism being uh, something like uh, like absolute monopoly capitalism of the nineteen fifties, in which like, ultimately the media has uh, like the the financialized forces of production or invested in the media that has like supreme power over consciousness um yeah so like these are like twin conditions of the end of ideology and like there is a third position that is like crucial and like peculiarly interesting and like compelling uh 
that is just that if I was to make an appeal for anyone who's interested in Adorno and ideology to take take away is that like Adorno claims that ideologies are true, um, right? And the the, ideologies the, are true, right? And that this is this is like the most like in, in some ways it's the most difficult, but also like one of the most compelling thoughts, right? And 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 what he means, what he means by this is not it it, it it's not that like. Uh, it, it, it's not that like ideology and all of their like stupidity are true. It's not 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 the case that like uh, there is a, a truth to nationalism, but it is the case that in the process of their falsity, like they touch on something, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. um, that it turns out that in the dynamics of society, that so if if we have an idea that the ideologies are false. Right. One of the questions becomes like, what? In order to say that they're false, I need some kind of idea of them being true, right? Or, or and some 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 measure of truth against the ideology, yeah. right? And so the question becomes like, where do I get this measure of truth? Yeah. And and Adorno's like answer, which is curious, is that you get it kind of within the ideology itself. Um, yeah. Right. Yeah. It's, it, there is no like eternal. There's no, it's not like Plato. There is no like eternal idea with which I measure like the falsity of like mm -hmm. the phenomenal world, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. But rather like precisely the like, history that produces ideology is also producing a, a kind of truth. And I think you know Marx is not very far away from this as well. Like yeah, yeah. you know, uh, like Marx doesn't say like he doesn't say like the lives of the workers are better if you uh, if you become like disabused of this like nonsense about value mm -hmm. like, it's not like your life in the factory it's going to like uh radically change from knowing differently mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um but like the the concept of truth in marx which is actually a concept of communism um is 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 uh like very close to this like question of truth in adorno that like yeah <laughs> well like like i guess you could say in the sweep of history if if the processes of the culture industry have been decoupled from this historical genealogy we've tried to articulate of the ideologues and like that the culture industry now stands in for what they used to do as a function he says at the end their their message their main ideology yeah uh, uh to the masses is become what you are right and, um, and so, is, so like, this is also the, there's yeah. this very interesting argument about uh like the manipulative moment um and and that uh, we one of the things that we find in, across the history the long history of ideology that we've discussed today is that there is this like you know what what adorno calls it like a technical manipulative moment so um like back in the 18th century the thought is like if you can clarify if you can have like these sort of self-transparent reflected views on people's own interests like maybe i can like kind of make a society that accounts for all of that mm. right mm. And, and again in 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 in, in napoleon there is a, a kind of manipulative moment right about like even if i've got some kind of class war going on i have to use some force to like unify right um a very manipulative moment in, in napoleon and 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 what we get and and the same is true in sociology right this is true in in comptian sociology and uh you know uh, uh, and and the notions of progressivism that we get in the 19th century mm -hmm. is that okay like perhaps it's not no longer has the agency of something like the the ideologist who um who like controls the system right who makes sure all the organs are working as you said but instead it, it this becomes like an impersonal historical process yeah. of progress yeah. does this work for you yeah right um like one of the things that adorno is interested in is is how like modern social theory is then used against people right and the like the continuity of this technical manipulative moment and like one one of the things he says is that like people are kind of made into sociological sociological categories so sociology goes and like get solicits the opinions of people 
-hmm. it then like fixes its results and then it feeds them back to the people mm -hmm. as a mode of manipulation yeah right and and, and and therefore it fixes people into their like patterns of opinion or patterns of prejudice yeah right this becomes the all like all you are is the pattern of your prejudice right right, right. um because like this is what defines you um which is why, which is why Adorno is so, so, so prophetic to 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 uh, digital algorithmic right. control societies because he had a premonition of this so so long ago. And I think at the at the heart of it is such a beautiful commentary regarding the the deprivation of 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 a certain trajectory of of individualism in some sense, uh, 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 the deprivation of a, of a, of a of the singular expression of individualism and the and the, the 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 confinement of that in some sense. Of course, as a Marxist, I don't think he's committed to to preserving I, so I think individualism. The, but I think the but there's something there I, I see in this whole thing of and he's right, which is this um this this new new type of alienation. I mean, there's nothing more monstrous than become what you are. Right. There's nothing more monstrous than that. I mean, there are, but it's a very monstrous proposition. Um, I mean, I, so I, I think yeah. you know, there's, there's obviously like there's a, there's a kind of joke going on with this idea of become what you are being yeah. a mantra. Um, it's like a pop, that, a pop Nietzscheanism or something. No, no, no. It's it's it. So I was going to say it's not Nietzschean. It's 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 like this. So one of one of the processes that's like deep in the recesses of this essay on ideology that he wrote is this idea that like a world of like total media right in which there's like media but no longer an object or no longer a subject right a media a medium that doesn't seem to communicate between anyone anymore but like has simply absorbed uh absorbed all of that into its own mediaticity right um so this he he's gonna say basically collides with absolute ontology Right, it, it it turns out to be the same thing as someone who says they're just things. Right, there are right. no relations. Um, yeah. There is no medium, and so uh, like there's a sense in which um, there's uh, yeah yeah there's a sense in which like the the relation without the thing and the thing without the relation are like one and the same problem, and so that that is why. Or, or, or maybe they're not they're one and the same problem you know like maybe these are our, uh, you know i offer the argument that these might be our, like twin ends of ideology like in one we get like the fascism like the cult of blut and boden you know this uh like absolute like ontologized like everything is thingly and defined by its thingliness and the other we get the like media monopoly but the consequence is the same for a theory of ideology which is that it it, it collapses um right because it turns out that like the fund the, the so-called fundamental truth and the sphere of appearances are like one and the same they're rigid they are thingly um they like, even even as the media like proclaims itself to be like absolutely liquid it turns out to be like fixated um yeah i mean so like the fact that the culmination of media is like a joke about like being is 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 a profound like philosophical and textual importance for Adorno. Um, how does this how does this um, lead Adorno and Horkheimer as well? And we talked about this before we started to 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 um, reconsider um, what speculative philosophy in fact is, yeah. uh, because in some sense they're trying to derive um a new direction for speculative thought um and and then therefore also a whole critique of existing philosophy positivism pragmatism etc i wonder if you if you have thoughts on that um you yeah. know what i mean if, if, if because it seems to me the consequence of this and of course the jargon of authenticity and heideggerianism is a huge a huge culprit of this right-wing ontology in some ways so I wonder, yeah, and I know we can we can close soon, but how does this, yeah, how does this affect philosophy and specifically speculative thought? So I think this is a um, this is going to be a really like complicated question, and 
I'm, I'm, I'm wary to like delve like directly into the Hegel problem, but it's like sat there. Um, so, you know, in, in Hegel, we have, I, I would argue in Hegel, we have uh, like a combination of a social theory and a media theory. Now, of course, we have like a bunch of other stuff in Hegel, but like, ultimately we've got like a social theory and a media theory, um, at least in early Hegel. Um, can you can you say what you mean by media theory? I mean, I I think I understand, but how do you, in a colloquial sense, what do you mean by media theory? In so, like Hegel's, uh, like Hegel's notion of like, notion of spirit um, is a notion of a medium, right? It's uh, it operates like. If, if we're going to be like crude about it, right? Uh, it operates like between things, between people and things, between people and objects, between objects and people, between people and people ultimately. Um, but like the course of the spirit is a process of, um, the, you know, the course of the spirit is a process of like perpetual mediation. Um, and you know, in, in it's it's not a process of mediation without residue. Like, in fact, it, it is constantly leaving like residues or marks. Um, so it's it's not something like uh, you know you could imagine you could imagine media uh, as something like what we know like now if we think about say the radio where it like you know blasts out of a speaker into your head and out the other rear and then it's disappeared forever right and never makes this sort of seamless unmarking media um but no like the 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 hegelian spirit is like covered in hooks um I will say also that, of course, like for early Hegel, the category of love is incredibly important, and uh, like Hegel's theory of love is also a media theory. Um, it's not just a media theory; it's also like a, but it's it's pretty close to it. So um, yeah, so in that sense, you could say media theories. Um, the implication, if we call Hegel a media theorist, is that sociality and the uh, is 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 composed of um, an infinite array of mediations, and it's kind of a study of mediations and so on and their right. effects, and that's one way to understand dialectics, I, I guess. Right, and and, yeah. and of course, like in in Hegel, this becomes like increasingly and in explicit in uh, like his discussions of objective spirit. So, like, if yeah. you want an account of art, and if you want an account of religion, right? The the question is is like not it, the, the question of say the history of art is not just like why it is that people made representations in this way but like it's a question of like how people relate like it's a question of like how people come to know and understand each other like the um like how they also like fail to understand each other or like might have to create objects in the world in order to do so and that those objects in turn like start to master their relations to each other so like, the realm of objective spirit in hegel is is like, absolutely fascinating and and like it should be like on our minds for example when we discuss newspapers um or 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 any or or, or twitter or whatever like you know like this is just hugely instructive to me um uh, th this is, of course, like a very crude version of Hegel I'm giving you, but it's it it, it, it it's something, and it's it's also to say that like those those the the world of objects is not just a world of objects, uh, just as like the world of people is not just a, a world of like, individuals, um, but that there are like relations, and those relations are full of like quality and history themselves, uh, like in themselves. In itself, the spirit is of history, and it is history. Um, 
and, and and so like that needs to be the caught in like a strong sense like the the, the problem for adorno so now i've now i've done my, my like short version of hegel um the problem for adorno is like we have uh a dialectic that seems to have been truncated it's got stuck somewhere right that the the, the the true relation between people between people and nature uh has got stuck under the dominion of like objectivity right we for it's like for adorno the, we the, had, the objectivity that we talked about before in right, a way yeah right. yeah and so uh like so in that sense it's a very historically materialist grounded direction that he's taking negative dialectics is that yeah. is that fair yeah yeah i mean you know that this will work out in various ways and there's there's in negative dialectics a, a critique of hegel as well on like, the question of nature um, which is you know it's, its own like just very very complicated philosophical problem um but Need, needless to say, like the, the the spheres of objectivity in the media that seem to like overtake the history of the spirit itself, right? Which seem to implicate like what is the moving spirit in, uh, you know, let's just call it like the shabby eternity, right? This mere endurance of things which has taken over from the eternity. Uh, like oh yeah things should carry on as they are because they are like this this absolutely like shoddy thing uh has overtaken like the place that it, 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 infinitude and eternity plays in the hegelian dialectic uh, like what do you do with it like this is who knows this is like a very thorny question i think it's one that adorno doesn't really offer a, a great number of solutions to but like needless to say like the thing he doesn't do is he doesn't say like uh we can just strip this back and find like uh, some kind of like, ontology beneath it. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know if that's that's helpful. No, that's 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 very that's very good. That's very good. Um, well, look, I mean, I think naturally we've uh, <laughs> been. been uh, I think it's always a good time to to conclude on, on the on the hope only that maybe you might join us to in the future to discuss perhaps negative dialectics itself yeah. um, in some way i know that text is is hard to hard to to get at but um you know maybe this yeah. is maybe this is a text whose time has come because i, I was i you know i've i've done i've done a lot of work on negative dialectics uh and like it's a, it's obviously a peculiar book because it's a book which starts with like 150 pages of or like 200 pages of a, a rant against Heidegger, um, and like why is this like like this? <laughs> in fact, like this rant against Heidegger is so long that it becomes its own book. It becomes a jargon of authenticity and the first half of right. negative dialectics. And like at the time it was written, and and. Like at the time it was written, this was like unfashionable. No one really engaged or understood why this was important. Um, like for a while afterwards, um, the continental philosophy was split in a way such that uh, like most people said, "Oh, we're, we're we're just not Heideggerians." Meanwhile, in in France, all the Heideggerians are like working away at their thing. Uh, uh, saying, you know, we're, we're just critical of Heidegger. We're just enough critical of Heidegger. Mm. Right now, I think, you know, maybe maybe we're at a time where this sort of deep confrontation on the mm -hmm. of ontology, Indeed. of history, of thought uh, can, can take place uh, now like in, in this sort of untimely way. Uh, but yeah, I'd, I'd love to talk about negative. Yeah, I would be, I would be curious. It's, it's interesting, yeah, because there's uh, what is this new this new text um, Heidegger in Ruins has come out, of course, in the last five, six years, the Black Notebooks. Yes. Um, so there is an appraisal afoot um, that is interesting. I mean, of course, I'm appraising someone like Nietzsche right now myself, um, but in a much different way, I think, than Heidegger, because um, 
or rather that Nietzsche needs to be addressed differently than Heidegger's addressed, um, precisely because of uh, Nietzsche's distance from from the rise of totalitarian fascism and so on. Yeah. But that's a whole, that's a whole other thing. I mean, I, I'm I'm, I'm going to have to say, uh, like, since we're just digressing for the end of this onto Heidegger, I have to say that uh, my my joke that I tell my wife is that uh, the problem with the uh, the problem with Heidegger is he that everything operates in philosopher voice. So like I, I think of him like you ever watch those like uh, Adam Curtis documentaries? <laughs> yeah, of course. Right, and so like Heidegger is kind of like Adam Curtis for like mid twentieth century philosophy, which is just this like as long as everything is like intoned in like booming philosopher voice enough, like it it, it might be just enough to convince everyone that it's philosophy. Um, in the same way that like uh, Adam Curtis is like, if I boom in boom in documentary voice enough, I can convince everyone that this like silly history is a, is a documentary. And so you know, I yeah, the two things to say about this, of course, like this comes with disrespect for Heidegger, but also it means that like a deep investigation into the aesthetics and style of Heidegger is mm -hmm. absolutely crucial and this is you know a project that Adorno yeah, initiated yeah. right yeah. Uh, like this is the the thrust of what we're going to find in jargon of authenticity but I, I find this compelling <laughs> sure no no for sure and of course we recently on my program my my study groups we did a whole study group on the destruction of reason which of course Adorno had that whole thing with Lukács over his refusal and denial of that text. Um, and we're actually going to be publishing a um, series of essays on Lukács' destruction of reason with, with historical materialism. Um, oh, great. So, yeah, um, because I do think that, um, yeah, well, I do think that the critique of Heidegger there would be interesting to read, the one that Lukács offers, to read in tandem with, with Adorno's own and to then kind of look back and see a sort of theoretical solidarity that went awry largely because of stalinism right ultimately but um uh maybe maybe does not possess as many riffs as we as we thought no i mean it's i don't know i find it i find it depressing to read lately i mean i i love Luke catch as i said earlier i, I just happily like, i'd happily read Luke catch all day every day um, but it is uh, like it, it's also clear that like so Adorno is obviously like incredibly frustrated with the fact that like Lukács is like remains probably the smartest guy he's ever met, right? And like it's not like Lukács becomes stupid; it's just that like Lukács has a habit of like writing some st slightly stupid things. Uh, yeah, I think that's fair. I mean, I think um, it's, like the accusation yeah. against Lukács that we find, for example, in this like uh, in the reconciliation under duress essay is is not like, oh, look how much his mind has been blunted by uh, decades of Stalinism. The accusation is like, what on earth is this incredibly smart guy doing, like abusing, like like abusing what are good thoughts with his mind? Why, why the cunning? Like, yeah. Why this? Like, yeah. Well, I think that's interesting. I mean, I think for Lukács, there was a strain in post-revolutionary German thought that was what he called right-wing epistemology. And he tried to surgically isolate it and excise it yes. and to ask what revolutionary history or sort of um, what, th what what thought would what could could be with its excision in some yeah. sense uh, uh, as Traverso says in his review of destruction of reason it's written from the perspective of the socialist victor so it's a it's yeah. a consideration of history from the position of, of communist uh, of communist victor which is a really interesting way to look at the text um and then of course the problem for adorno is he rejects the category of um irrationalism um which i think upon further analysis and scrutiny is very um interesting because what it is is it's an assault on both of those strains you mentioned 
both of the neo-kantian and the neo-hegelian currents and it's it's a way to show that both of them um had a certain inadequacy yeah so so in that sense oh, of course and, and, and like this is this is what we can like basically always rely on uh on lukacs for is like he's about as interesting a rationalist as we can find yeah that's you know, right that's like, right like, yeah. rationalists are like renowned for being boring and like yeah. lukacs is like the most exciting thinker and i think and, that's uh, right uh, i think uh, that's right but he but his claim his claim is that we can do hegelian rationalism without any flirtation with right-wing epistemology yeah. with right and i think for adorno and for benjamin and for others you do need a touch in the the dark arts or the you know you do need you, some some and that's a big question for me it's like what does i don't i don't have i have no answer to that but but he lays down the provocation for us um yeah i mean you know um, I think that one of the questions will be like what 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 on earth is the role of kant in like later or no like why 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 this endless return to kant and not just say in the critique of pure reason lectures of 1957 or whenever they are um but but also like right up to the this like late work and negative dialectics and, uh, and interesting theory, right yeah. and like what 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 is kant doing here what's he providing well because yeah the, of course his comments right. on the the lectures on the problem of of morals morality adorno's right was um really anti-kantian i mean it's just a strong sense but, right? but, then, but nonetheless kant does provide him with uh with like a whole set of questions about what he calls the constitution of subjectivity, yeah. right? And and which you know play, plays quite an important role in 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 the ideology stuff. So like if I want to say like well what is ideology, like what 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 does it do? Is like well the answer in like a strong way for Adorno is the constant it constitutes subjectivity. Yeah. Um, like it, it takes the forces and relations of production that constitute subjectivity out of it. And like, where does it constitute subjectivity? That's another question. However, yeah, Kant is uh, necessary here. Um, and, uh, like Hegel's not going to do that for you. Yeah. Oh, like, you know, Lukacs might think that Hegel does it for you, but, uh, like that, yeah, I mean, that's very helpful. Well, you know, I'll just conclude by saying perhaps a question to you, which is, you know, if if I pose to the group, our group that we do these events with, if they wish to maybe do a study group on on negative dialectics, it might be interesting. I don't know if you've done yeah. that recently, but perhaps perhaps that would be fruitful for us to pursue. Oh, yeah, no, I'd, I'd, I'd happily be in a study group on negative dialectics. I'm in a just started another aesthetic theory reading group that's being run by some uh, musicians. I'm, I'm, I'm a musicologist by ancient background. Once mm -hmm. upon a time, I did a music degree. And so it's like nice to be reading that text with like some composers. And wow. uh, and so, yeah, no, doing negative dialectics group would be would be lovely. Uh, and it's always good to, to you know, I'm, I'm I'm a textualist. Like I, I spend my time with like little bits of text and making arguments about them but like mainly just like reading hard and arguing about it and well, at least when i'm doing this work that's what i do um yes you know well, so uh, i'd happily happily be a part of some conversations okay okay great and i want to thank you for your insights for your time and this has been tremendous. Oh, I, no, thank I, you for having me. Sorry if we got uh, like distracted or no, no. went down went down a number of like kind of peculiar parts i'm I'm only going to say that i blame adorno because one of the things about these texts is that they the the sources and the consequences are just like very wide right so like when i pick up a text where the source material is like germ the whole of german classical philosophy mm. and like the history of like the whole history of social <laughs> theory right and then the consequence is like uh what it means for for experience in like late capitalism of the 1950s right uh, and its relationship to 
like big Marxist problems, of course, like we're going to be dragged in many directions. So I apologize if it became divergent no, no. Adorno for that. But no, thank you for having me. It's been like a real pleasure to talk about all these things. And yeah, absolutely. Let's, I uh, hope it's been useful to some of the listeners uh, or they found it intriguing or something. Absolutely. <laughs> no, no doubt that they will. I will um, press end, say goodbye to everyone, but hang on real quick and we can say, say goodbye. Amazing. Thanks, everybody. See you next time.